Hello, my name is David Ansara, and I'm the host of a new podcast which explores the world's most intractable problems and what to do about them. It's called Solutions with David Ansara, and we are going to be sitting down with influential thinkers from South Africa, where I'm based, but also other countries around the world to look critically at the state of the globe at the moment, some of the main challenges in terms of politics, society, and economics, and to offer constructive solutions to those problems. Our first episode is with the former Premier of the Western Cape province, Helen Ziller. She's also the former leader of the Democratic Alliance, the official opposition in South Africa. And she's written a new book called Stay Woke, Go Broke, Why South Africa Won't Survive America's Culture Wars and What to Do About It. In this conversation, we explore the origins of the woke ideology, the ways in which common sense, liberal-minded people can push back against this dangerous ideology, and also explore some of her experiences with cancel culture and the political fallout that ensued from that, as well as how she was able to successfully overcome that, that challenge. So please stay tuned for this conversation, which I'm sure you'll enjoy, and we look forward to having many more such conversations on this podcast. Helen, what motivated you to write this book? There was an immediate propelling event, as it were, and then a more cumulative event or series of events. The immediate event was that I was asked to look at the reading list for the Young Leaders Program for 2021. And I looked through the reading list and it looked very good. It had all the classical works there and many more contemporary ones, but it had nothing that would guide the DA Young Leaders into the new world that they have to face of identity politics and wokeness. And I felt that that was a huge gap, and I said so. And when I mentioned that this was a problem, I asked whether they could go and find a good book to read on this particular subject. I recommended one, which was The Madness of Crowds by Douglas Murray, but that didn't quite get to what we were facing in South Africa. And when we couldn't find anything, I just said, well, I'll write it. And then I did. So that was the compelling reason. And that's why I had to do it in such a hurry. I wish I'd had a little bit more time. I think I would have changed a bit of it if I'd had more time. But then the cumulative events over the past couple of years have really been my own story. What happened to me and how that affected me and how that brought me to new insights and I wanted to write that up as well. So it was a combination of things. So Helen, how do we understand this concept of woke? Because it seems to be a rather nebulous idea. What are some of the ideological origins of it? And how do we describe what we're seeing uh, today in the global environment and here in South Africa? Well, much of it goes back to postmodernism, but to make it more understandable to most people, I term it identity politics, which is the way that it is described in most parts of the world. That is your biological identity is the most defining attribute that you have and that gives you attributes in common with other people who share that common biological identity, primarily, primarily race, but also sex and gender, sexuality, disability, and other physical attributes. And those attributes are seen to trump any other attributes that could define your identity. And it is the battle between those biological identities that have traditionally dominated society, in other words, white heterosexual males, and other biological identities that have tended to be at the margins or at the bottom of the pyramid of society, that is women, people of color, people with disabilities and all others, in, I suppose, ascending order of victimhood become the alternative pole. And that biological conflict rather than class conflict becomes the motor of history. That's the idea of wokeness. And one of the other ideas here is of diversity and inclusion. And these seem like quite good things. It's you know, good to uh, be inclusive, but seems to have the opposite effect of that. It seems that uh, much of the behavior of people who describe themselves as woke uh, is quite actually intolerant of diversity of opinion 
uh, if you go against the prevailing ideological doctrine, uh, then th there are some pretty severe consequences for you. Uh, and you describe this in great detail in terms of cancel culture and how it manifests. So how does cancel culture work and how is it related to the ideology of wokeism? Well, wokeness is akin to a religion that believes fundamentally that people are excluded or included in society on the basis of their racial or other attributes of their biology. Basically, they're in eight attributes they can do nothing to change. And that is an article of faith in wokeness. And anyone who expresses a contrary view that other aspects of your identity, for example, may be more important than whether you're white or black, that may be more important than whether you're male or female or what your sexuality is, those ideas are considered taboo in the new ideology and anyone who expresses them or stands up for them or any derivative of them is cancelled in many parts of the world and especially the English speaking world. And that is what drives cancel culture. So for example, somebody like Richard Dawkins questioned why it was possible to choose your identification as a man or a woman but not possible to choose your identification as black or white. And for that he was canceled because race is seen as an immutable constant, a biological constant that determines identity. But the choice of gender is seen as a social construct unrelated to biological sex and should be a sliding scale that anyone is free to choose from. And Richard Dawkins challenging that idea and saying, well, if people can choose their gender, why can't they choose their race? Well, that automatically led him to being stripped of various awards and being marginalized from his pinnacle of being seen as a progressive humanist. Now, another person, for example, would be um, J.K. Rowling, who was also very publicly canceled because she said, that while she completely accepts that there are men who identify as women and when women who identify as men, she believed that people who physiologically self-identify as women are a specific category and that they should be allowed their victories of all of the struggles that feminists have waged over many, many years to identify as women and to take a stand as women and to have safe spaces as women. And of course, that is now called a trans exclusionary radical feminist because it is seen to exclude men who identify as women. And so JK Rowling was very cruelly canceled, including by Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watkins, two people whose careers she made. So it's quite extraordinary how having a different opinion and expressing that opinion can lead to be cancelled in that kind of way. So Helen, South Africa seems uniquely vulnerable to these trends given our fragile democratic institutions and also our history of racial conflict. What are the risks that you see playing out here in the South African context? Well, the risks are enormous, David, and partly because we've been there before. I mean, we all know what apartheid did. It said your racial identity was the overriding factor of who you were that would determine your destiny. And um, we all, well, many of us, fought it very, very hard because we felt that that was biological and racial essentialism, and we would have nothing to do with it. We wanted to be able to build societies and communities based on common values, common interests, common ideas, and the contestation of those values as the basis for political democracy. So that is what we chose to do. And getting back to the fundamental notion of apartheid, not as something evil and diabolical, as we always thought it was, but as something progressive, is quite frightening to me. I, I never, ever thought that that would happen in my lifetime. But it has happened, and the consequences for South Africa are particularly severe because it lends, it lends itself to a fundamental misdiagnosis of what our problems are. It says whites are basically the problem in South Africa. 
Now, it's a very beguiling argument to say to very many desperately poor black people that you wouldn't be poor if there weren't whites in South Africa. You wouldn't be poor if it wasn't for the whites in South Africa and the fact that many whites are not poor. And that beguiling argument with the misdiagnosis makes people miss the point that the fundamental problem is the fact that we don't have a growing economy, that we don't have a capable state, that we don't have investment, that we don't have jobs, that we don't have decent education. And if you remove whites from the equation completely, none of that would improve. In fact, it would probably get a lot worse. So the bottom line is, in South Africa, this ideology leads to a complete misdiagnosis and a solution that will make the underlying problems that cause all of these huge deficits in communities much, much worse. And that is the big challenge that we face, this misdiagnosis of the problem and then applying solutions that are going to make the problem actually worse, not better. Okay, Helen, so that's the particular characteristics of South Africa, but how is this playing out in terms of p politics and the political landscape? Uh, it seems to me that this plays into many of the ANC and also the EFF's uh, narratives and view of the world. How are they exploiting these ideas to, to gain political advantage? Well, wokeness is a godsend to the ANC because they can translate it straight into their policies of black economic empowerment. They basically say the fact that you're black is the most important thing about you. The fact that you're black is the reason that you're marginalized and poor. And the fact that you're black enables us as black people who are in the ANC to use blackness to impose policies that will massively enrich us and enable us to use the smokescreen of race to pretend that we are applying policies of redress, but we're actually using that to loot the country. And so it's given the ANC a perfect smokescreen for their policies of looting, for their policies of cater enrichment and deployment. It's given a perfect smokescreen for those particular policies to be able to be implemented and look progressive. Meanwhile, they are entirely self-serving and indeed retrogressive. But they sound good because they fall in with the woke ideology and the consequences and the methodology and whether they actually improve anybody's lives is easily overlooked because of the ideology. So Helen, your own party, the Democratic Alliance, uh, you've had your own brushes with wokeism and, and it has affected uh, the party itself. And you go into some detail about this in the book as well as uh, the attempted cancellation uh, that was largely driven by uh, opponents of yours within the party. Uh, could you elaborate on what exactly happened? What was the buildup to that event? And, and how did you overcome that challenge? Well, you know, South Africa as a whole, and not least the Democratic Alliance, faces the huge challenge of trying to win at the ballot box and of balancing all the political and other imperatives, which are very, very complex, to try and do that and to ensure that we maintain a commitment to non-racialism and inclusion at the same time. It's really not an easy task that we face. And I faced that task in particular and was desperately trying to make sure that the DA was an inclusive party that stood for shared values of constitutionalism, the rule of law, a market economy, non-racialism, separation between party and state, all of those things. And I thought it would be far more effective if we had leaders of all races promoting those ideas, which of course is true. And I was very committed to finding leaders of that caliber and ensuring that they reached the top spot and I made an enormous effort to do so. And as everybody knows, my efforts didn't work out very well. And I was particularly disturbed by the extent to which inevitably it was all turned against me in the end. And the very people that I'd supported as much as I could to rise through their own efforts to the very top of the pyramid, suddenly found that it had not satisfied the woke climate outside 
and that it had not in any way changed the narrative that we were a white party. And I knew that nothing would ever change the narrative that we were a white party because that suits the ANC. It doesn't matter how many black leaders there are in the DA. It doesn't matter that we have more black voters than white voters. That doesn't matter at all. The only thing the ANC and our opponents have is the race narrative. That's all they can play. And if we try to play into their hand of satisfying that critique of us, we will never be able to because that's the only critique our opponents have of us. And so what I found myself becoming a victim of was the DA's attempts to satisfy our woke critics that we were not a white party and being led into believing that if they could deliver my head on a platter, there would be a broad belief that we had now transformed because Zilla had been decapitated in the DA. And the irony was that no one had done as much as I had to try and transform the DA. And of course, I landed up inevitably as being the target of those attempts. And that is what I describe in my book. So Helen, I'd certainly encourage viewers of this channel to go ahead and, and grab a copy of the book and we'll link to the, the book in the description and the comments below. Uh, but could you describe the, the set of events uh, that led up to the furore, the, the firestorm on, on Twitter and uh, how you were personally affected by that and how you were able to, uh, to kind of push back? Well, indeed, um, I was Premier of the Western Cape at the time and I had the good fortune of going to Singapore and Japan and various other places. And I used to learn an enormous amount on those trips about how other countries had made extraordinary transitions in Japan from being flattened in World War II to rebuilding an extraordinary economy. And in Singapore, starting from a far lower base than South Africa in the 1960s, and really ending up as the, one of the world's leading economies with certainly the best education system and uh, jobs for everybody and a complete middle-class lifestyle for everybody. So they'd made that transition almost to the end of history in one generation. And it is quite an extraordinary story. And I learned as much as I could about that. And I wrote up in a serious paper for the government and in various other articles, but also in a series of tweets what my lessons were. And one of the key lessons was that they didn't try and destroy everything that they'd inherited from the past. They tried to build on the positive aspects that they'd inherited from the past. And they had done that with enormous success. And I tried to say that. Uh, Singapore was a colony for as long as South Africa. They uh, inherited certain basic institutions, the port, some educational institutions, various governance institutions from British colonialism. And they really sought to build on those and retain what the positive attributes were. And I mentioned that as one of a series of four or five tweets, I think, around that particular aspect of building what you, on what you've inherited from the past, not trying to destroy everything that you've inherited from the past. And that got the normal amount of negative haters on Twitter coming after me. And I said, look, you know, for those of you who believe that the legacy of colonialism is only negative, think of things like our independent judiciary. Think of things like our transport infrastructure, our piped water, things like that. They're all inherited from the legacy of colonialism, the English language, all of these things. And we can build on them. We don't have to destroy everything we've inherited. And that set the works absolutely aflame because, of course, colonialism is seen as one of the great, great evils of whiteness and one of the reasons that whites must be thrown into perdition for the rest of time. And that got the whole work engine going, including in the DA against me, and that set the wheels in motion. And how were you able to hold your ground? Because I think one of the things that struck me uh, in the book was how you said that apologizing is actually a poor strategic move because you end up validating the criticisms of your opponents. So you did apologize uh, and you, as you state in the book, regretted doing so. Um, but what were some of the other strategies that you used to, to push back? I did apologize and it was against my better judgment even at the time. But I apologized because I was convinced that that would help Moosey deal with the gathering situation. 
I felt that I would help him draw a line under it if I apologized quickly and we moved on because I realized he was now being put in a very difficult position by the work backlash. And I thought if I apologized, I would assist him to do that. What I didn't realize at the time was that he and his advisors would soon use that tweet as a rationale to try and get rid of me to prove that Moosey had decapitated whiteness in the DA and was therefore showing that the DA was a fundamentally transformed party because Moosey had got rid of Zilla in the party. I never realized that that was the strategy until quite long afterwards. I actually thought, well, I'd stated an obvious truth. It was in the matric textbook at the time. It had been stated repeatedly by Nelson Mandela and even Chinua Achebe and other people you know, across Africa again and again and again. It's just history 101 that the legacy of any past era is not only negative and that whatever you can build on in the future, whether you want to or not, is the way that progress happens. And I really just thought if I apologize and get this out of the way, you know, we can move on. But that didn't happen. And the great advice I would give to people today, and I do give it to them in my book, is if they believe that you haven't done anything wrong, don't apologize. It just makes things worse. It makes your opponents believe that they have now proof that you've done something fundamentally wrong, and they will always find the reasons why your apology isn't sincere enough, is not far-reaching enough, et cetera, et cetera, and they just take that on to the next stage. And of course, all of this plays out on social media, Helen. So uh, you have some very interesting reflections in the book about the way in which Twitter in particular was manipulated during that time, uh, the role of bots and sock puppets in terms of driving specific messaging and coordinating attacks against you. Uh, could you describe for our viewers how that works? Yes, indeed. Um, I didn't even know about it at the time. I was pretty naive and very few of us knew about things like Bell Pottinger and Troll Farms and Cambridge Analytica and all of those names that have become household names of scandal since. But I got an IT forensic expert to investigate my account, especially after Twitter did that big bot cull a few years later. And that revealed the extent to which fake accounts had been involved in a whole network of interlinked computers to drive this furor as hard as it could go. And a lot of the outrage was built, developed, and amplified by computers, not real people. And that is why it was perceived to have been this overwhelming tsunami of outrage, which was actually a couple of thousand fake accounts linked to each other through computers that geometrically progression this whole thing to make it look like the biggest storm that has ever hit social media in South Africa. And that was deliberately done at the time of Bell Pottinger and Cambridge Analytica. And I've even identified one of the key accounts that was at the heart of it. He's a Dr. Mohammed Adam, who's a medical alumnus from the University of the Witwatersrand. He was very central in that. And I could really draw the dotted line between all of these accounts and what they were doing. So it was a massive strategic intervention that was definitely driven with a purpose by a network of interconnected computers. So Helen, in your book, and the, the title of the, book, of the book alludes to this, uh, you say, what can be done about this growing risk? Uh, so let's try to unpack that a bit more because we are very aware of some of the negative externalities that are being caused, uh, the deterioration of public discourse, the breakdown of institutions. Uh, but how do we as ordinary people start to come up with alternatives and start to build alternative ways of interacting, uh, building new institutions and pushing back against this rhetoric that we're seeing? Well, the first thing I say is that people must have the guts to speak up. You know, it's really very easy in the face of cancel culture and the face of being marginalized if you have a different opinion. 
it's very easy to keep quiet and to rather say, look, I'm not going to say anything about this because I, I can't stand the consequences. So I give a couple of sample conversations in my book that enable people, I hope, to get the arguments they need to have the courage to speak up. And having the courage to speak up is incredibly important. And I'm thrilled to see that on social media across the board, there are these liberal networks and ecosystems that are developing within which people do have the courage to speak up and are arguing their case much more forcibly than they've ever done before. So that is very exciting and very good. And I'm pleased to see that. The second thing is there's always safety in groups and in numbers. And more and more people are getting together to resist this. So come to wait by um, spearheaded by Helen Pluckrose in the UK is one of the networks of a whole range of professionals and individuals that have got together to support people who are facing cancel culture and who are being canceled. The other thing is that in the aftermath of all of the woke ideology that is permeating institutions, the great risk that follows on that is the risk of a failing state. And I analyze the role of the private sector in supplementing and often replacing state institutions, the role of NGOs such as the Institute of Race Relations and others in keeping alternative voices alive, the role of self-help organizations across the board that substitute for a failed state and support people to navigate the consequences of that. And then of course, the voices and the parties that are trying to hold out the idea that your biology is not the sum total of your identity, that your race does not determine your identity, and that values, ideas, principles, policies are far more important and that we need to bring people together across identity markers to build new majorities of common identities of values and beliefs. And those are the kinds of things that we need to do with a renewed urgency and complete focus in South Africa. And as wokeness drives people apart with huge centrifugal force so that you have the populist and the alt-right versus the woke left, it's never been more important than it is today for people like you and I and other people who believe that it's possible to build a new centrist majority to be speaking out and to be doing that day by day, because otherwise we will be eviscerated in the polarization and the wars that result from it. So Helen, that's certainly very inspiring. But in terms of the political game that is currently being played in South Africa and the electoral arithmetic, the DA obviously is a significant presence in parliament, but still only has around 20% of the vote. Uh, how do you begin to build that liberal democratic center, the rational center, as you term it in your book? And how do you actually capture uh, the, the levers of power and start to reverse some of the uh, more damaging uh, policies that have so affected South Africa? Uh, how do, what is the, the strategic approach um, to recapturing the center? Well, it is, we must all accept the politics of the long haul. This is not an overnight journey. It's not the journey of one lifetime. There's a reason that we are celebrating the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. And that is because these things take a long time. These ideals are almost counterintuitive when you see human tendencies to default to the identity group. So these are big ideas that have taken a long time to develop in countries and are on the back foot now. But I hope and I believe that this will be a temporary back foot and that we will make good progress in the future. So one first has to understand that this is a long-term strategy. The next thing I've always said is that you've got to win where you can. And that is why I left Parliament to stand as a mayoral candidate for the city of Cape Town to try and start winning at local government level and to show that we could bridge biological differences to form new majorities on the basis of ideas and values and principles and good governance and a competent state and service delivery. And that has seemed to work very, very well. We seemed to have a very big breakthrough in 2016 where we managed 
to get into government in a whole lot of metros outside of the Western Cape. But the tragedy of that was that our governments didn't really internalize the value set and the ideas that we were trying to extend beyond the Western Cape. And so you do have times of significant growth and you do have times that are setbacks and times of consolidation. Now we went through our setback in 2019. We're currently in a stage of consolidation and we will consolidate and go through a spate of regrowth again. I have absolutely no doubt about that because the entire history of the DA and the DP is one of growth, setback, consolidation, regrowth. That is the wheel of history. And we're going through that part of the wheel of history now. Okay, so that's party politics, but not everybody is politically involved. Some people just want to uh, preserve their communities or their families. And in the book, you go into some detail about the different ways in which communities are self-organizing. You refer to uh, the role of the private sector. You also look at uh, movements like the Solidarity Movement, uh, which has a, a kind of a, a self-sufficiency uh, philosophy to it. Um, do you think that in the absence of political change, these bottom-up community-led initiatives are going to be uh, the source of real fundamental change in South Africa? Indeed, I do. I believe that um, both are essential. I don't think it's an either-or. I think you desperately need political parties that can build a new majority, and you can only do that in South Africa if you span across the lines of racial identity. You can only do that. And that job is really very important. But it is not mutually exclusive of other initiatives that seek to look after marginalized groups in one way or another. And they have been very successful and uh, have done an enormous amount of work, good work, in a context of an increasingly failing state. And the tragic irony is that the people who keep on voting for the party that is leading us into a failed state continue to do so while expecting the private sector and others to pick up the slack for the state's failure. And until people learn that a failed state must result in a change of vote, we're not going to have rapid progress on that front. Helen, in the book, you reflect on the original drafting of the constitutional framework, which you played a role in, and the federal system that was never to be. Uh, we have some level of federalism in terms of our provincial structure, but very limited and constrained powers for the provinces. And you obviously were the premier of the Western Cape for 10 years. And it seems that there is growing sentiment around uh, Cape secession. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily just uh, highly visible on social media, for example, but it certainly seems to be an idea that wasn't around uh, 10 years ago, but seems to be gaining momentum today. Uh, how do you think that could play out, if at all? Do you think that it is realistic uh, that we could see some kind of secessionist movement emerging? And could a greater degree of federalism be an alternative, a more realistic alternative to that? Well, a greater de a degree of federalism would be fantastic. It would be ideal. It's what we've been pushing for for a long time. And we'd love to have much more provincial autonomy. And certainly, we did not nearly get a federal enough constitution. It was what was negotiable and realistic at the time and feasible at the time without the whole thing blowing apart. And the key thing was to get a result at the time. So it was not nearly federal enough in, in my view and many other people's views. However, it's what we've got. Now, Cape independence is frankly not realistic politics. It can only happen if you can get a significant majority in parliament and in the National Council of Provinces. So ironically, if you want independence or greater federalism, you have to start voting for the party that supports federalism and that can drive that from the national government, because that is the only way that we can get those changes that we need to support greater federalism. So that is one point. The second point is that ironically, the huge success of the DA in the Western Cape 
is what is driving these demands for Western Cape independence. And it would be the most tragic irony if those demanding greater independence were ultimately to undermine the DA's chances of winning the Western Cape by driving splinter parties that were looking for unrealizable objectives, such as Western Cape independence. We believe that the whole of South Africa is worth fighting for. We believe that although it's going to take time, we can get people to change their minds. It's very disheartening to see the tremendous devastation the ANC government has wrought on South Africa and the extent to which their vote holds up. Obviously, that's disheartening. And one of the tragic ironies is that the more poor people become totally dependent on handouts from the state, from food parcels to social grants, the less they tend to see that as a result of ANC failure in government to grow the economy and to get jobs, and the more they see it as the dependence on the state for which they therefore then have to vote. And this is the, the, the tragic, vicious circle that we are trapped in. But this is a process and we have to drive it as hard as we can and make the points as hard as we can, because there was never going to be any easy work or walk to a sustainable democracy in South Africa. And we decided to start with a democracy and aim towards economic inclusion and economic liberation. Many other countries did it the other way around. In the East, they did it the other way around. They got their economies growing first and then moved in the direction of more democracy, or many of them tended to. We'll see in China whether it also ends up in that way or not. We don't know. It's a very uh, complex situation. But we started with a democracy, and we have to work through democratic levers to try and get a successful economy that's inclusive of all. That is our challenge. Helen, do you think that during your two terms as Premier, you pulled enough of the levers that were available to you within the provincial administration? Did, did you flex your muscles enough in terms of uh, education, health, and some of those other shared competency, competencies as well as the exclusive competencies uh, that are available uh, to a Premier? Um, well, education... Looking, certainly, looking back... No, yeah, go ahead. No, education, certainly. We were one of the first to ditch outcomes of based education when um, we came in. We've started things like collaboration schools that the unions have taken on. We've started a um, school evaluation system, a whole range of things that, that were, were not in the National Schools Act. We put in the Provincial Schools Act, and we've really done huge amounts to, to build quality in the Western Cape school system through measures exclusively in the province that, that don't exist nationally. And we've had to take the uh, unions on and many others on in the process of trying to achieve that. In health, it's, um, I would, well, the differentiation has become very apparent in this COVID crisis, the extent of maintaining the capacity of the system, the quality of the system, the functionality of the system. And often that's what you best do in, in provincial government. You keep the quality of the system going and you keep it capable of servicing people. So I think that that differentiation has become very clear. In the policing area, well, I took on the national government a lot when I wanted to establish a commission of inquiry into various aspects of policing and those sorts of things. The trouble is cooperative governance, which is at the heart of our constitution, requires a lot of functions and competencies that are exercised constitutionally by different spheres of government. And if you hit on the complete incompetence or lack of political will of national government, it is extraordinarily difficult. And you have to keep on plugging away. That's why we've got to win nationally, and we have to get far greater devolution of powers to provinces. And voters have to understand that it depends on them. There is no other way. We cannot have independence of the Western Cape without a civil war. I don't understand how it could possibly happen. And that is why the politics of the long haul, persuading people, pushing people, winning where we can, being competent in government where we are, is the only way we can realistically proceed. Yeah, and I think a, a big stumbling block is money and the fact that National Treasury controls uh, over 90% of financial allocations to the provinces means that uh, your power as a as a leader of a province is is circumscribed. 
Uh, well, you so don't have an independent tax base, and much of that money comes as conditional grants, not everything, but a lot comes. You just have to pay your staff. There's nothing that you can do about that. But, you know, there is maneuvering room, and I think we use the maneuvering room to the greatest possible extent. But in a unitary system like we have with a few federal fig leaves, it's quite difficult. But the answer is to drive for greater autonomy and greater federalism and not, I'm afraid, the unrealistic objective of complete independence, because that's not happening. We will never, ever get that through mm. Parliament at the moment or through the NCOP without huge strife. And even if we did, I mean, how are you going to defend a border that stretches from the Eastern Cape to the Northern Cape? So, Helen, I want to change the topic slightly before we let you go. And I noticed that you self-published this book. This is your second book. Your first was published through a more traditional route, uh, through Penguin. And I wanted to get an understanding from you. Why did you uh, decide to self-publish? Uh, are you disenchanted with the, the, the mainstream publishing houses? Because they are not themselves immune from wokeness and the various pressures that come with it. Yes, well, indeed, they are very much under the lash of wokeness, uh, no question about that. And Penguin Random House had all that trauma with trying to publish Jordan Peterson's books, if you remember. And they went through a huge backlash of their staff. There were two reasons. One is Penguin Random House that published my first book said there is no market for political books in the current climate, which I think I've proved not to be true. But secondly, that you can save so much money in publishing yourself, and that enables you to bring the cost of your book very much down, which is what I wanted to do, and make it far more accessible to people. So I decided to go that route, and I'm not sorry. I will never publish through a conventional publisher ever again. And Helen, where can people go to find out more about the book and to grab a copy for themselves? Well, it'll be available in all the bookstores from the 26th of April, so you're not constrained in any way in getting your book to the bookstores if you self-publish, and of course, primarily through Take A Lot and through Amazon. Helen Zilla, thank you very much for joining us on the show. We look forward to having you back one of these days, and good luck with the book. It's been great, David. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much for joining us for the inaugural episode of Solutions with David Ansara. I'm very much looking forward to speaking with more influential thinkers about the state of the world and to discuss how we can solve some of the world's most intractable problems. My name is David Ansara. Thank you for joining us on the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.